In 2019, there was a public outcry over the problem of surprise medical bills, and there was bipartisan agreement in Congress about the importance of ending surprise billing. But although legislation targeting the problem advanced out of key congressional committees with support from both parties, Congress ultimately failed to pass a law to end surprise medical bills. I'm Stephen Morrissey, Managing Editor of the New England Journal of Medicine, and I'm talking with Aaron Fusay-Brown, an Associate Professor of Law at Georgia State University. Professor Fusay-Brown has written a perspective article about Congress's inaction on surprise billing. Professor Fusay-Brown, could you start by telling us a bit about what surprise medical billing is and why it happens in the first place? Yeah, so surprise medical bills are out-of-network, unexpected bills that result typically in two situations. The first is when a patient sees an emergency provider and is unable to select a provider that's in their health insurance network because of the emergency situation. And so whenever they see an out-of-network provider, the health plan doesn't necessarily cover the higher cost sharing and the full cost of seeing that out-of-network provider so the patient might get what's called a balance bill. And so that's the balance bill and the higher cost sharing together, what we call surprise medical bill. The other situation you might receive a surprise medical bill is when a patient receives a surprise out-of-network service from a provider who's out-of-network but is at an in-network facility for the patient. So, for example, if a patient is receiving surgery and the surgeon is in-network, the facility is in-network, but the anesthesiologist is out-of-network, that would also potentially generate a surprise medical bill. So you say in your perspective article that an estimated 20% of U.S. emergency department visits and 9% of inpatient admissions involve an out-of-network provider. Why is surprise billing more common when patients see certain types of specialists or are at for-profit institutions or in concentrated markets? How does this divvy up? Surprise medical bills aren't something that are generated by all providers equally. It is, as you point out, those types of providers that tend to have their volume unrelated to whether or not they are in network with a patient because the patient doesn't essentially choose that provider. So if a physician is, like I said, in an emergency situation, or sometimes it's the ancillary provider, the anesthesiologist, the pathologist, the radiologist, someone who's hospital-based, is not someone who the patient is selecting. So therefore, the patient doesn't have any ability, and the health plan doesn't have any ability to sort of steer the patient to an in-network provider in those instances. So there's not a lot of incentives for these types of providers to contract to go in-network with a lot of health plans because they're going to see the same number of patients, and frankly, they can bill a higher amount if they stay out of network than if they agree to a negotiated, which is usually a discounted contracted rate. In the absence of federal action, what kinds of action have states taken to address surprise billing? And is there evidence that any of that has been effective? So I think about 28 states at this point have passed surprise medical billing legislation of varying degrees of strength. So some of them are fairly comprehensive and some are a little bit more limited. But more than half of states at this point have passed some legislation to address surprise medical billing. And the problem with the state laws, a lot of them are well-designed and well-intentioned and can be fairly effective, particularly if they are comprehensively designed. The problem is is they don't reach a large subset of the population, and those are people who have self-insured, employer-based health care coverage. And that is a large chunk of the privately insured population do get their health coverage from their employer, and that employer is self-funded. And because of the federal law, the Employee Retirement Income Security Act, or ERISA, those health plans are just sort of beyond the reach of any state regulation. And so the requirements that these state laws put on health insurance plans to participate in either the independent dispute resolution process or to hold the patient harmless, none of those can be applied to these employer-based plans in these states. However, we are seeing that in those states, there are some significant protections that are extended to patients. For example, they may not receive a balance bill. And that, to a lot of patients, is the thing that is most concerning. So these are significant consumer protections. It just doesn't reach all consumers in all states, and that is why a federal solution is necessary to protect all patients across all markets. So given all of that, why did Congress fail to pass a law to end surprise medical bills in 2019? What were the major points of contention that prevented a final agreement? So I think that some of the major points of contention really boils down to coming up with a methodology for determining how much that out-of-network provider is going to be paid by the health insurance company. In all cases, I think everyone or just about everyone agrees that the patient should be held out of this dispute, held harmless from this dispute, should not have to pay any more than their in-network cost-sharing amount that they would normally owe if they went to an in-network provider. And so that part is fairly well settled. 
the big dispute really comes down to how much will the health insurance company pay this out-of-network provider who, in a lot of cases, is saying, well, we want to be free to bill something higher, what we think we're worth. Maybe it's closer to their billed charges or their what they call their usual or customary rate. And it's often a negotiation between an argument, frankly, between health insurance companies and these out-of-network providers. And so some of the bills pick different methodologies. Some of them use a benchmark that says the sort of default accepted reasonable rate would be the median in-network rate for similar services in that geographic area. And so how do you approximate what an in-network agreed upon amount would be in the absence of an agreed upon contract? So that's one way that the legislation has tried to use existing sort of market benchmarks in order to determine what's a reasonable rate. On the other hand, another approach is to use independent dispute resolution. And so to sort of say, well, we're not going to let the government set a rate, even if it's just pegged to the market rate. A lot of providers in particular want the freedom to argue that they should be paid more in any given instance and go to dispute resolution and use an arbitration process to let an arbitrator decide how much in any given experience of care, what would be a reasonable amount for the services that they provided. So the arbitrator uses something called baseball-style arbitration, typically, and that just means that each side, the health insurance company and the healthcare provider, put forth what they consider their last best offer, so what they think best approximates a reasonable rate for what they think the service is worth. And then the arbitrator simply has to pick one of those, the one that they think is closer to the fair reasonable rate. The arbitrator isn't free to set its own rate. So that sort of style of arbitration rewards making reasonable offers. And it also, if you sort of make the losing party pay the cost of arbitration, then you also incentivize these parties to come forth with real approximate rates that they think are going to be a reasonable rate. However, as we've seen, some states have tried this strategy. New York comes to mind, has a baseball style arbitration. The success of this arbitration depends on what the arbitrator may consider as what are they comparing a reasonable rate to. So for example, if in New York, arbitrators are allowed to consider the 80th percentile of charges. And we all know billed charges are somewhat untethered to anything in the market. It's just sort of a unilaterally set price. And so as a result, I think there's been some early evidence that in the New York example, when the arbitrator is allowed to consider something like billed charges, then it inflates that reasonable rate up and up and up. So over time, we see those prices rising. And so the cost saving that we would expect out of the surprise medical billing reform are just not there when you have that dispute resolution process that doesn't seem to kind of keep a guardrail that manages the price inflation that comes from things like considering build charges. So the sticking point is that these details about how you set the out-of-network rate end up typically favor one side or the other a little bit more, right? So providers really favor arbitration. Payers and patient advocacy groups tend to favor a benchmark approach because they think it's a lot more simple, it's more streamlined, it lacks the sort of administrative expense of arbitration. And both sides sort of think that their side is the only way that's fair, and that's where the argument is, and that's why we're seeing trouble. Congress struggled to pass a law that seems to have bipartisan support and a lot of patient clamor for something to fix this problem. So in that regard, you mentioned in your article the role of large donations and lobbying pressure from private equity firms in preventing the kind of compromise that people were looking for. So what kind of stake do private equity firms have in surprise billing, and why were they so effective in keeping this legislation from happening? What we've seen over the past decade or so is there's been a large influx of private equity investment in certain types of healthcare sectors, and in particular, certain types of physician practices, as well as freestanding emergency rooms and air ambulance companies. And what we're seeing is that a lot of these private equity-backed physician groups have adopted a balance billing and out-of-network strategy as part of their overall revenue strategy. So remaining out-of-network, relying on out-of-network billing to increase revenues for the investor has become a critical piece of their revenue, frankly. And so any of these surprise medical billing laws that curtail or clamp down or prohibit balance billing and this out-of-network strategy will also threaten their bottom line. And so we're seeing a lot of effort for whether it's advertising or direct lobbying of members of Congress to campaign contributions. We've seen sort of a very large-scale effort to put a lot of money towards stopping the more 
cost-saving measures in a lot of these surprise medical billing laws. And so even though we saw this compromise approach emerge at the end of, in December of 2019, coming out of the Senate and the House, there was a lot of momentum behind that approach, and it sort of adopted both a benchmark and a dispute resolution. It really was a true compromise. It didn't favor one side or the other in any particular way, but this compromise approach was, frankly, torpedoed because of the lobbying efforts of these private equity-backed physicians and other healthcare groups that stand to lose some of their profits as a result of some of the reforms that these surprise medical billing measures would put forth. And so as a result, the House Ways and Means Committee put forth its own proposal, and that, in essence, scuttled the compromise that had emerged from the House and the Senate, and nothing ended up getting passed at the end of 2019. Of course, Congress has taken surprise medical billing back up again this year, but that fight is still persisting. We see the private equity-backed physician groups and other types of healthcare companies really taking their argument to the members of Congress and trying to press on them that they are not to use any type of approach that would use a benchmark, that providers should be free to seek arbitration or other types of dispute resolution, and that really a lot of the cost-saving measures are being slowly squeezed out of the bills as this pressure mounts. So finally, given all of that, do you think there's any chance that legislation will be passed in 2020? And what would you think would have to change for that to happen? Well, I still have hope that legislation will pass in 2020. I think that there is complication now because I think a lot of the attention or the health care attention in Congress and elsewhere are focused on coronavirus response. So I think in some ways the momentum has been slowed in terms of getting something this session uh, on surprise medical billing passed. I do think that there is some hope. I mean, there are two active bills right now from the House Ways and Means Committee and also the House Education and Labor Committee, and they both are pretty close. The House Education and Labor Committee looks a lot like the compromise that we saw developed between the Senate Help and Energy and Commerce last year's compromise. And the Ways and Means Committee is a little further away from that, but it still, in many respects, has some of the same structural features. So it's possible that a compromise will get all the way through Congress and to the president's desk this year. I think that the lobbying effort, as I mentioned, is ongoing, but the lobbying is happening on both sides. And I think patient groups and those who are concerned about rising health care costs and those who really just want a solution to surprise medical bills realize that they need to be part of this conversation as well because it's certainly not the case that all physician types, all physicians, all types of providers would stand to lose under a surprise medical billing reform. It's really only those types of practices and types of specialties that rely on out-of-network billing as a revenue strategy that really will see their profits change in any way from the result of these surprise medical billing legislation. So I think that that is something that I hope that there is still that same public momentum and that there's a lot of public support. I think something like 80 or 85 percent support. It's bipartisan. Among the public, I think the public really, really wants Congress to fix this problem. And so I think Congress wants to produce a win in healthcare in this space because there is so much bipartisan agreement, and it's just a matter of whether they can work out those differences in a way that will allow something to get all the way across the finish line. Thank you, Professor Fusay-Brown.